Thank you uh, very much and good afternoon. Thank you for the invite and the, uh, the warm introduction. Um, I, uh, you, you heard some of my background and it is sort of probably important just to reflect on that background for a minute as to what I bring to this just in terms of the uh, significant amount of time I spent working at FERC on a variety of issues, um, not just uh, natural gas, but certainly um, uh, wholesale power markets and all the other things that FERC does. So um, it, it sort of obviously um, gives me a little bit of a different perspective on what's going on and particularly about um, some of the things that um, I hope to share with you uh, today. Um, it's also a little bit, so first of all, let me do a show of hands. How many FERC experts do we have in the room? Yeah, I knew we had one. Um, John Gregg, who you're going to hear from next, was actually one of my first bosses when I graduated from college. So um, I'm a little bit humbled and, and ashamed to be speaking before him. Um, so he can correct anything I say that's, that's wrong or incorrect. Um, but what I hope to do today is provide you a little bit of an overview of just what FERC does. I mean, I think most of you probably know just because you know, you're in the industry, but, but a little bit of an overview of what's going on. Um, and, and really what's going on with the commission right now, because it's an unprecedented time uh, of flux in the membership of the commission. Um, talk a little bit about FERC's role in pipeline infrastructure development and, and what's going on in that area, um, and some of the policy developments and, and challenges that FERC has faced uh, and will continue to face uh, going forward in moving pipeline, interstate pipeline infrastructure projects forward. Um, and then I'll try to prognosticate to the extent I can on what might come next in a new administration and with what will be um, a new Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at some point soon. Uh, let me caveat that by saying is if last November taught us anything, it was that um, being in the prediction business is a bad business to be in. Um, and unfortunately, as lawyers, we're often in the paid prediction business. So, um, so I guess they're worth what you paid for them, but, um, but in any event. So as you know, FERC is an independent regulatory agency in the executive branch of the US government. Well, what does that mean? Um, it means that its members, its five members, are appointed by the president and they're confirmed by the Senate. Um, and they serve staggered five-year set terms. Um, and they can only be removed by a president for cause. So the end result of that means is that they have some level of autonomy from any given administration. Uh, there's a carryover between administrations because of the staggered set terms. Um, there also can be no more than three of any one political party. Um, so that all, that structure is intended to give FERC some uh, bit of insulation from politics, from the whims of administration to the administration uh, and to Congress. Um, that level of insulation kind of wavers from time to time. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that FERC is immune from politics, because it certainly isn't. Um, but it does have a very significant statutory role to play um, that, is, that was given to it by Congress, and particularly in the Natural Gas Act, which give FERC, gives FERC a number of responsibilities that it has to carry out. So FERC is both a policymaker and almost a, 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 a panel of judges, in a way. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, the president designates the chairman of the commission. Um, so that is uh, how an administration can sort of guide FERC without really um, directing its day-to-day -day work. Um, the FERC staff is entirely career civil servants, which is a little unusual among federal agencies. Most federal agencies have many uh, political appointees. Um, FERC only has those five, the commissioners. Um, the rest are career civil servants uh, in various aspects of their careers. And, and that's, what, that's what I was for my entire time at FERC as well. So under the Natural Gas Act, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is most of interest to you, um, FERC's jurisdiction or its authority um, is over a pretty defined set of issues that are, I always like to say, both very broad and very narrow. Um, so. FERC's regulation is really of transportation of natural gas and interstate commerce. Um, and so that includes, most importantly, what I'll talk about most today, certification of interstate pipeline facilities, so granting approval to site and build those projects. Um, the rates, terms, and conditions that are charged for transportation on those systems. So not just the, the, the dollars that you spend, but also 
um, how you access the pipeline, um, and other kinds of terms and conditions of service. Um, pipelines are what we call contract carriers, so those things are all uh, done under contract, but it's approved by FERC. Um, there is a very small amount of sales of natural gas commodity that FERC still regulates, but it is almost entirely deregulated at this point. Um, FERC does have an important role to play in ensuring that natural gas markets are not manipulated uh, and are free of fraud and abuse, um, and that, of course, has become a more important uh, role for FERC since 2005 when Congress gave it that additional authority, uh, which includes million-dollar-a-day civil penalty uh, authority, so that will get your attention. Um, and FERC also certifies um, LNG import-export terminals. Um, and that, uh, at one time, was a very significant and very controversial part of um, FERC's work. It still um, is a significant part of its work, but maybe in a little bit, bit of a different way now. So what is FERC? It's also important to remember what FERC does not do. FERC does not regulate any production, gathering, or processing. Um, it doesn't regulate any kind of interstate service, so any kind of service that uh, begins and ends within one state uh, does not fall within FERC's jurisdiction. Obviously, local distribution and retail sales, that falls through state commissions. Uh, commodity imports and exports. So uh, while FERC approves the construction of LNG import-export terminals, it does not actually approve the import or export of the commodity. That is left to the Department of Energy. Uh, under uh, Section 3 of the Natural Gas Act. And um, natural gas commodity prices, as I mentioned, for the most part, are completely uh, unregulated and subject to market. And then, of course, as you all know, FERC does not regulate safety either. Um, that lies with Department of Transportation. So what's happening at FERC right now? Well, we don't really have a commission. We only have two commissioners. Um, three commissioners remained at the end of the Obama administration. Uh, on February 3rd, Commissioner Bay resigned after being replaced as chairman by acting Chair LaFleur, who herself had been chairman once before. Um, some of you may know her. She worked in this region for many, many years at National Grid and other places. Um, so she is currently the acting chair of the commission. Um, Commissioner Honorable is also still uh, at the commission. Um, but her term ends on June 30th of this year, and she has announced that she will not be seeking to be reappointed to the commission. Um, she may serve till the end of uh, the year when Congress adjourns, um, unless she is replaced beforehand. Um, the end result of this is that the commission needs to have at least three voting members in order to take action on any um, major and even routine matters that require a commission vote. Um, so obviously the biggest of that for this industry is um, certificates to construct new pipeline facilities must be approved by a commission vote. So currently, there is no uh, entity that can do that. Um, and that's pretty important, obviously, as you can imagine. Um, and it has gotten the attention of a lot of folks. Uh, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the implications of that. Um, one thing that I'll talk about as well, and, and maybe highlight a little bit here, is um, the commission staff can take many actions on its own under what we call delegated authority. The commission has said, here's a, here's a set of things that you can do as staff without a vote. Um, the commission's done that for a lot of reasons. One thing, those, these are fairly routine matters, but also to make sure that projects and other things before the commission can keep moving. Um, if everything required a commission vote, I worked for a commissioner for many years, um, that's a long and arduous process. It's not unlike trying to cobble together enough votes to pass legislation. Um, and so if FERC were required to do that for every single aspect of, say, the construction of a pipeline project, uh, when you want to go ahead and clear trees to begin a project or something like that, um, needing commission approval for all of those things obviously would, would, would slow uh, those projects to a crawl. So um, delegations of authority to staff have become much more important now that we don't have a quorum. So uh, just recently, um, two, uh, the Trump administration announced the nomination of two new commissioners. Um, the first is Robert Powelson. He's currently the vice chairman of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Um, and he's also president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, he's been a very prominent commissioner at the state level for many, many years. 
Um, and so he will come to this with a very, very deep background and he will understand FERC um, very well. Uh, the second nominee is Neil Chatterjee. He is a, currently a policy advisor to Senate Majority Leader McConnell. Um, uh, Neil understands the energy industry backwards and forwards, both from his time in Kentucky as well as uh, he's worked for the majority leader, I believe, for more than a decade. Um, he'll be a little bit new to how FERC works, um, but he understands the industry uh, very, very well. So two solid nominees so far. Um, there's been a lot of discussion that there will be a third nominee shortly as well. His name is Kevin McIntyre. He's currently a partner at the law firm Jones Day in Washington um, and uh, was part of um, the Trump campaign team as well. Um, and he is expected to be designated chairman. Uh, that nomination hasn't been made yet. Um, the president doesn't have to um, announce when he nominates folks who will be designated the chairman, but um, most folks are, are believing that it will be Mr. McIntyre um, and that that will happen uh, really any day now. Um, so uh, with those nominations, they'll have a hearing in the Senate, um, and then they will be, uh, we expect, confirmed by the Senate. Um, and then the commission will have a quorum and be able to do business once again. Uh, likely, likely we'll have three commissioners. They will join Chair LaFleur. Um, and um, depending on how all of this works out, the way this normally worked, again, remember what I said about predictions. The way this normally works is that nominations are often paired. And so since we have Commissioner Honorable leaving the commission as well, uh, filling one of the Democratic seats, we would expect that a Democratic nominee would be named as well and that there would be a package done to vote through folks at once. The fact that there's no quorum is putting a little bit of pressure on that process. We've also not really heard a lot of names of potential Democratic commissioners. Um, so, and again, the, the willingness of everyone to deal on Capitol Hill these days seems to be fairly limited. So um, we will see how that all plays out. That's normally how that would work. Um, so that's to be seen. I, I think we can expect to have a quorum I would hope by September and perhaps maybe even sooner now that we've seen these nominations. So let's talk a little bit, and I'm going to kind of maybe skip through these just a little bit quickly so that we have time and I don't um, take any of John's time. Um, so FERC's role in, in the construction of interstate natural gas pipelines is what I really wanted to focus on today in terms of a, a key policy issue that's affecting you all very directly in the industry. Um, so FERC, as I mentioned, reviews applications and issues certificates for, of what we call public convenience and necessity. Um, essentially, it says this pipeline is needed and it should be constructed and it should be constructed in this location. Um, you know, now, as part of that process, FERC has to conduct National Environmental Policy Act reviews of the projects and their impacts on the environment because these are deemed major federal actions and that statute requires any agency who in engages in a major federal action to conduct that review. FERC is what's considered the lead agency, but there are many other federal agencies and state agencies who have a role in granting authorizations for these projects. Uh, if you are obviously digging a trench, so you may need a Section 404 water, Clean Water Act permit uh, from uh, the Corps of Engineers. You may need other permits from EPA for emissions from compressor stations. Um, National Historic Preservation Act and Properties Act is also uh, relevant as well to the extent you're uh, affecting historic and cultural resources. So all of these permits have to be obtained as well and FERC acts as the lead agency in that role. Um, when it issues its certificates, they typically include many, many conditions to address environmental and community impacts, 20 or more generally, uh, sometimes many, many more. And then FERC's role going forward is to oversee construction, to ensure that it is conducted in accordance with the conditions in the certificate, um, and that uh, safety and environmental impacts are minimized and other things like that. That construction piece is really handled by FERC staff and not the commissioners. They oversee that process. They grant uh, um, authorizations that are needed to move forward with different pieces of that. Oftentimes, projects can only construct during certain times of years to avoid disturbing endangered species and things like that. Um, so FERC will oversee that process and ensure that construction is happening within windows, within what the project developer committed to do uh, in those kind of things. So. This authority to grant certificates for pipeline construction 
includes kind of a number of different elements. Um, and also, interestingly enough, it includes authority for FERC to either approve or disapprove of what we call abandonment of facilities, meaning I don't want to operate this project anymore um, and I want to shut it down. And that's really a consumer protection measure to make sure that there are not consumers and shippers who are relying on that infrastructure um, to serve their customers. Um, certificates are required to construct new greenfield pipelines as well as to expanding existing pipelines. Really even the smallest of expansions requires a certificate. If you want to um, do a, a small incremental expansion in your capacity that maybe requires simply upgrading a compressor station or building a new compressor or something like that, all subject to this authority and all requires a commission vote to approve. Um, the, the, the language that Congress adopted was that projects should be approved when they are in the present or future public convenience and necessity, meaning this project is needed by the public. It's needed to ensure reliable and sufficient supplies of natural gas. Um, and of course, FERC has authority given by Congress to establish any reasonable conditions. Importantly, what this statute does that many other energy statutes at the federal level does, do not do is it gives that holder of that certificate the right to utilize eminent domain. Meaning if it can't reach an agreement with land landowners to build that project, it can go to a court and obtain a court order to acquire whatever property rights it needs. Um, obviously, that raises a lot of controversy for projects. Um, interestingly, pipeline, um, pipelines don't have to use this authority as often as you would think. They normally are able to reach reasonable agreements with landowners to pay just compensation for, uh, for use or even taking of their property. Uh, but it is becoming more and more of an issue. And, and as, as many of you know, if you follow the news and other things, um, government eminent domain authority itself across the board has become a much more controversial issue. <clears throat> so, you know, I covered a lot of this already. So the key question here is what does it mean to be in the public convenience and necessity? And that's really up to FERC to define, right? So Congress uses those words and Congress and FERC gets to define that. Um, and so how FERC has generally chosen to define that is to look to market need. And in 1999, it issued a policy statement um, that said that's exactly what it would do, that it would uh, let the market decide when projects are needed. So how does it do that? Well, under this certificate policy statement, um, it really looks to see that new projects can be built without any um, uh, subsidy or, or on the backs of existing customers. So what does that mean? It means that pipelines are generally going to go out and they're going to do a, um, if not generally, in fact, they're required to, conduct an open season to find um, expressions of market interest for projects. They then sign contracts, precedent agreements, with shippers on the pipelines. Um, typically, that was load serving uh, local natural gas utilities. But increasingly, it is also um, producers of natural gas. Um, and they sign up, and they commit to the project. They commit to fund the cost of the project. And FERC has generally said that is a sufficient demonstration that that project is needed and in the public convenience and necessity. Once FERC determines that there is market need, sufficient market need, generally determined by a project is fully subscribed or um, close to fully subscribed, um, FERC then looks at the impacts of the project on the environment, on communities, on other pipelines and their captive customers as well. Um, so will this project create, you know, in that instance, uh, a real burden on other pipelines that are existing? Um, in terms of taking customers, dividing the customer base, things like that. Um, and then, of course, all the environmental impacts um, uh, that, that you are aware of that these projects have. And so at the end of the day, FERC grants a certificate, grants approval to that pipeline if it finds that the economic benefits of the project outweigh any adverse impacts of that project. Um, and so what we'll talk about in a minute is that usually by the time we've gotten to this process, FERC is granting approval for that project because these projects have, have been able to demonstrate that they uh, have benefits that outweigh adverse effects. Um, but it is an economic test, and FERC has defined it that way. FERC is traditionally an economic regulator. And so that creates controversy with environmental groups and landowners. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so what are some current challenges to this 
policy. So this policy has been in place since 1999. In the world of FERC policy and regu regulatory policy in general, but FERC in particular, who regulates such a dynamic set of industries, that is an ancient policy. That's practically the Magna Carta, to have it be around that long. Um, so it's really, it's, it's well established, it's in place, the industry understands it, um, and it has been very successful in quickly moving pri pipeline infrastructure projects forward. Um, and in fact, FERC has generally been considered among the federal government to be one of the best at efficiently siting pipeline infrastructure. Um, but the uptick that we've seen in the last several years, and really when I say last several years, I'm going back to 2008, 2009, up through uh, the present, the uptick in interstate pipeline construction, not only in terms of amount of dollars spent and miles constructed, but also just in terms of where it's located. Um, we're increasingly building pipeline infrastructure in places that just aren't accustomed to energy infrastructure in general. Um, here in the Northeast, um, par parts of the Marcellus Shale, et cetera, um, we're seeing a lot more scrutiny. Um, environmental and community groups have really come to view FERC as a rubber stamp because of that economic test that they do. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. We can talk about those. Um, but, for, but environmental groups and climate activists in particular have really chosen FERC as a focal point. Um, in their quest to reduce use of fossil fuels. They believe that the pipeline infrastructure is really what's facilitating all this. Um, and they're probably not wrong, right? It's critical to get gas from supply areas to uh, consumers who need it. Um, so um, they have really stepped up a very concerted and very public effort um, to bring their advocacy to FERC. Um, They've engaged in a civil disobedience campaign, including disrupting public meetings at FERC, um, disrupting the operations of FERC headquarters, um, and even taken direct protest actions to the chair and commissioners themselves outside of their homes, um, et cetera. This is virtually unprecedented uh, in FERC's history to have this kind of direct, uh, vocal, civil disobedience type uh, efforts being placed at the commission. Um, the commission has done a remarkable job of continuing its work in the face of all of that, um, but it has put a lot of additional added pressure on the commission. Um, and I, I think uh, will make it more difficult for the commission to get this work done going forward. It's it just the, the sustained level of pressure that we've seen has been pretty remarkable. It really started while I was still there. I left about two years ago, but um, there were weeks where advocates um, sought to shut down the building um, so, um, you know, we were able to keep things moving by giving people pretty flexible ability to work where and when they wanted. Um, but it does definitely have a disrupting effect and, and staff definitely notices it. I'm going to skip through this. This was just an illustration of kind of where we've been on pipeline capacity additions. A lot of you know that. Um, and you've seen all this too. Um, just, a, just a demonstration of we've now got these new supply basins that are in places where we don't have a lot of energy infrastructure. That's the point of this slide to show you. Um, and so really that's created a whole new and different level of controversy around these projects. One of the things in particular that's interesting is I reviewed probably 150 certificate orders when I worked at the commission. And um, for every certificate order you got in the northeast or along the eastern seaboard um, that were just full of summaries of um, angry citizens and environmental groups upset about the project and seeking um, to have it denied. Um, when you're in places that were used to energy infrastructure, the Gulf Coast region in particular, you got about an equal amount of letters of people advocating that the commission hurry up and approve it. Um, so sort of an interesting dichotomy there and really tells you about um, just the difference it makes kind of being used to and accustomed to energy infrastructure. So I mentioned that FERC lost quorum on February 3rd of this year, and, and at that point lost the ability to approve uh, new proposed projects. Before that, in the months before that, um, the commission issued several orders to try to move as many um, projects as it could. Um, and I want to quickly highlight a few um, that raise some interesting policy issues that I think will be relevant going forward. Um, I call them 11th hour, the, the Jordan Cove I'm going to talk about next was kind of not really 11th hour, but, but it was pretty significant. It was, it was done in 2016, right around the election or just before. 
Um, so Jordan Cove is an interesting case study. It, it's an interesting case study in a lot of ways. So this is an LNG export terminal uh, that was proposed in Coos Bay, Oregon. And may, many of you may have read about it, or maybe you were even involved in it. Um, but it was uh, both an export terminal and then a 232-mile interstate gas pipeline from the Oregon-California border to bring supply to that terminal. This project was originally proposed in 2004, I want to say, as an import terminal. So you can this that really kind of makes this project a case study in, in what's just the dramatic changes we've seen in the gas industry in general. That this was originally conceived as an import terminal when gas prices were going up, supply was was deemed um, to be um, was viewed as potentially getting shorter and shorter. Um, so when the market really flipped in 2008, 2009, and 2010, the commission dismissed their application for an import terminal, and they reapplied uh, to build the project as an export terminal. Because of the pipeline connected to the project, FERC's um, certificate policy statement applied. And for the first time in recent memory, the commission rejected the project, said market need had not been demonstrated. Um, and in particular, um, the problem that this developer had was that they didn't have a sufficient number of signed commitments to the project. They had many expressions of interest. Um, the terminal itself had a license to export gas from DOE, but FERC determined that those things were not sufficient to demonstrate significant market need that would outweigh um, the potential harms of the project. So that was a pretty significant thing. FERC hadn't really done that. Um, certainly in my time working with the commission, um, and certainly not under the certificate policy statement. This project is likely to have a third uh, rebirth. Um, the Trump officials in the Trump administration have pointed it out specifically as a project that, quote, ought to be approved. Um, and so I think you may see it uh, refiled in short order when uh, a new commission is constituted. Um, Another interesting pipeline project that was an 11th hour decision um, was the Rover project. And I think if you read the trade press at all, you've seen a lot of press around this project. Um, it's intended to move gas from the, uh, from the Marcellus and Appalachian region uh, into Michigan. Um, now, the commission I mentioned has a lot of, granted a lot of authority to staff to try to move construction processes along. Another thing it's done is granted most certificate, really all certificate holders, a blanket certificate to um, engage in certain kinds of what is con are considered routine and not particularly disruptive construction activities without seeking prior approval either from staff or the commission. Well, in this case, the developers of the Rover, Rover pipeline intentionally demolished a home that was eligible for listing as a historic property. Um, my understanding is they did so in spite of warnings from FERC staff and others to not do that. Um, and the consequences were pretty severe for Rover. They lost their blanket authorization to conduct routine construction activities, which means they need FERC staff approval for nearly every single um, activity they have to do, um, which is going to cause a pretty significant hardship for that project. Um, and there's been a lot of news lately. They were, um, they were fined a significant amount of money for destruction of that property that they apparently haven't paid yet. Um, so a lot of things going on. But it just shows you that if you do trip up on some of these things, there can be really severe consequences. And it was one of the first times in a while that FERC had actually imposed a consequence like that. And then the last thing I'll mention um, is um, the commission approved, I, I believe, the day before it lost quorum. I don't remember the exact date. but. Um, a pretty significant project in Pennsylvania and New York intending to expand the national fuel and empire pipeline systems uh, in that part of the region. Uh, there's proposed gas-fired power plants in that region and other things that uh, have a pretty significant need for gas. Um, and former Chairman Bay, on his way out the door, issued a very extensive separate statement. He agreed that the project should be built. He supported approval. Um, but use the opportunity to lay out a number of policy issues with the certificate policy statement um, that he thought ought to be addressed going forward. One is that economic need test that I talked about earlier. Um, a lot of uh, studies that have been done, including by FERC's own staff, suggest that the interstate pipeline system has been built out, with some exceptions, this region being a, a big one, 
um, to the extent that there's really very little um, pipeline congestion left, at least as a general matter. Um, and so you really have, therefore, a low basis differential in the value of transportation between different places. Um, so what does that mean for the economic test for these projects is, is a question that he raised. Does that create a boom and bust cycle where you have to wait for a significant uh, basis spread in prices before you can build a project? He raised some fairly fundamental questions about how that economic test works and whether an economic test alone is the right way to approach the certificate policy. He also noted a particular um, issue that has gained more prominence recently, which is um, many pipeline projects, I shouldn't say many, but several pipeline projects recently have been supported by um, contracts with affiliates of the natural gas pipeline. Uh, or several affiliates will sign contracts to support the need for that project. And there is a question there about whether affiliate demand is really true market demand. Um, and so there's a real dispute about that going on in the industry right now. That was another thing that, that former Chairman Bay highlighted. To date, the commission has said, yes, that is real demand. Someone is willing to put up money to, um, and bear the risk to build that project. And so that is real uh, market demand. But it's an issue that's out there, and a lot of pipeline project opponents are really seizing on it um, today. And then he also focused a little bit on the environmental reviews that the commission conducts. Um, and in particular, the commission has really pretty steadfastly held to considering the direct impacts of the pipeline's construction and operation itself, and has really avoided studiously going beyond that to consider what are the environmental effects of producing ga the gas that will ultimately be in the pipeline. It's generally said, um, these pipelines are part of a system. The gas could come from everywhere. That's an environmental impact that we can't uh, reliably assess based from our vantage point. Um, another recent question has been, um, particularly as the last administration really sought to have climate impacts and greenhouse gas emission impacts more prominent in environmental review, um, whether FERC should be considering that full life cycle impact of uh, the use of gas on the climate. Um, and the commission has steadfastly refused to do that as well, but that's something that um, uh, Chairman Bay raised as well. So I'm, I'm sort of running short of time, so let me, um, let me skip through a little bit. Um, these are some of the direct challenges that, that you can see from a litigation perspective that can slow down projects. Um, I think I'll skip through those, but, but they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, that's just a listing of all the other environmental permits. Let me talk just for a minute about, so what can we expect going forward? This is the um, 10 cents for advice uh, portion of this. So generally with administration changes in FERC, I, I think it's wise not to expect major sweeping shifts in policy or focus. As I mentioned, the agency is very focused on specific statutory duties that it has under the Natural Gas Act, the Federal Power Act, uh, and related statutes. Um, not only that, but the commission has a really strong bipartisan tradition in general. It is very rare that uh, the commissioners disagree and split on party lines. Um, and there's been strong bipartisan support for pipeline development as well, um, including Chairman Bay, former Chairman Bay, even though he raised some of those issues. Um, he was a very strong proponent of continuing to build uh, natural gas pipeline infrastructure. He thought it was critical uh, to reliability and to consumers. Um, and then because FERC acts like a court in a lot of ways, it is very guided by its own precedent. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've got this pipeline certificate policy statement that dates back to 1999. So um, upending that is not a simple thing to do if the commission were to do that. Um, courts would look at that very skeptically. Um, and so, um, so I think it's, it's wise not to expect major uh, changes. Now having said that, we're in a time where we're going to have a new chairman and as many as four new commissioners. Um, and so that's obviously going to create a change in policy emphasis. It's the largest turnover on the commission, I think, since 1993. Um, and they're going to need time to review what's on the shelf, what staff is sort of put on the shelf as first priorities, um, and then develop their own prior priorities as well. And that process takes time. You know, when you're a, I worked for a commissioner who was brand new, and, and we spent a lot of time in the first six or eight months just going out and talking to industry um, and getting a sense of what they needed, what the perceptions were, what the realities were. 
Um, and that's an important thing that I think every commissioner does. You know, obviously someone like Robert Pallison will, will have a lot of that knowledge, but he'll have to come at it with a completely different vantage point now. Um, so I think those are some things that to, to keep in mind. So, so with that, what, what can we expect that FERC might do? Um, you know, I think they're probably going to move quickly to approve projects that are ready to go and need nothing more than a commission order. Um, I saw a recent report from Baird Research that there's about 12 BCF a day um, and $16.7 billion of infrastructure investment that's awaiting FERC approval, nearly ready to go. Um, I think any new uh, chairman and commissioners, especially coming, uh, being nominated by an administration that um, talks a lot about infrastructure development, um, will have that as a pretty key focus. Um, you know, and then I think even though, as I mentioned, FERC has been um, one, of the, one of the really models in terms of efficient siting of infrastructure by a government agency, there is still a lot of criticism of delays in the process. Some of those delays are recent, and I think they come from the public pressure I talked about earlier. So I think you may see a new chairman at least think about, now whether they'll do it publicly, I don't know, but think about ways to kind of continue to speed and streamline that process. Um, one way to do that is to more aggressively hold states and other federal agencies who have to grant permits um, to schedules for granting those permits. FERC is the lead agency, has authority to set schedules for other agencies. And if those other agencies don't adhere to those schedules, there is a path to um, ask a court, an appeals court, um, to, um, to provide a remedy for that. What that remedy is, it could be a direction to the agency to do it within a certain time frame. There's a number of things that, that could potentially happen, but that's a relatively recent authority that was given to FERC and, and question whether FERC will start to use that a little bit more aggressively. Um, I talked about blanket authorizations earlier. Um, could the commission maybe try to expand the scope of what's uh, within blanket authorizations such that there are less things that pipeline developers will need to come back to the agency for? In some ways, that seems to fit into, I heard mentioned in the last panel, of the Trump administration's what we call two-for-one policy on regulations. Um, in some ways, that may fit into that. Um, those policies don't um, legally apply to independent agencies, but most independent agencies, including FERC, have committed to try to, uh, to abide by them. Um, so I think you'll see that as well. And then obviously, one of the other things you can try to do is shift uh, more staff and more resources uh, to the effort to cert uh, certificate pipeline um, infrastructure. That, that's a hard thing to do in, a st in an agency like FERC. So FERC's got 1,400 people. But when you look at the scope of what they do, they're pretty thinly staffed already. Um, the Natural Gas Act is just part of what they do. They've got wholesale energy markets. Dam safety you know, is one thing they do that takes a significant amount of resources um, and, um, and staff. So that's a difficult thing to do, but certainly one that you could see. Um, I, the other thing I didn't talk about much, but um, the commission spent a lot of time uh, up until about a year or so ago on gas electric coordination issues. Just that whole effort to try to get the gas industry more aligned with the electric industry who is becoming a bigger and bigger customer of gas, uh, of the gas pipeline system. Uh, the commission spent a lot of time on commercial issues around scheduling practices and other things to try to align those better. Um, issued a couple of rules and kind of didn't necessarily declare victory, but sort of de declared a pause um, to see how things would work. Um, but it is certainly something that, that they've still looked at internally, and I think it's something that, that you may see uh, a return to as um, a new administration focuses on reliability and infrastructure. Um, and then I think the last thing is you're going to have to expect a lot more litigation over FERC project approvals. We've already seen a significant uptick in FERC orders being appealed to the Court of Appeals. Um, there's been a number of cases in the last several years, and I think you're going to see more and more, uh, particularly because in at least one of those cases, pipeline opponents were successful. Um, so I think you will see um, uh, a lot more litigation. It's really with a I think probably from the environmental perspective, a lot of those folks are going to feel like with the way things are aligned in Washington right now, courts and litigation are one of their, uh, one of their most effective tools.